welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us. You know, Brian, we've been a little bit dry here. In fact, we've been quite a bit dry in our farm this summer. And when you think about dry conditions, it changes everything with the herbicides that you put on, with the fertilizer that's left from this year's crop. We're going to talk about the impacts into next year's crop from your decisions you made this year. Well, speaking of next year, what's going to happen with input costs? Commodity prices have been going up, not necessarily for all the good reasons that we would like to think, but commodity prices have been going up. So that probably means we're looking at some price increases going into 2013 with input costs, but we'll talk about what is going up and what's going down coming up today. Well, with all these things changing, you know, one thing has to stay the same, it's problem weeds. We'll show you how to control this tough weed in our Weed of the Week segment, but first, here's today's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we wanted to discuss pre-harvest intervals. What does a pre-harvest interval mean? What is that? Well, what that means is you have to spray a certain pesticide so many days before harvest, so there isn't any residue left of it in the grain. Like for example, in wheat. If you're spraying wheat, you know what? You don't wanna have any residual herbicide or insecticide in that wheat. So like right now, we're ready to harvest this field, but we've got some bugs out there. All of a sudden, grasshoppers are coming in. Well, wow, we should kill those grasshoppers off. Well, no, we can't because we're gonna harvest in two days. There's no product that we can spray right now. Well, there are a few, but realistically, there's no product we're gonna spray right now that's gonna help our wheat out because we're gonna harvest it in two days. So what this pre-harvest interval thing comes down to is it's about protection for consumers in the end because eventually a lot of the crops that we're producing on the farm across the country and across the world, they're going to get consumed by either livestock or human beings, and we just wanna make Make sure that they're safe. So that's the reason why the government will come out with pre-harvest intervals. Now how does the government decide that, well, with this insecticide it's 21 days and this other insecticide it's 28 days, how do they know? Well, you know, there has to be a lot of testing done and when you think about that, who should do that testing and who should pay for it? Well, it's the chemical company that wants to sell that insecticide, Brian, that's going to have to pay for that. So let's say, for example, that a chemical company says, you know what, we need to be able to spray right up to seven days before harvest because because there's some you know, mysterious insect now that comes right before harvest and eats all the wheat. Well, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna have to do a tremendous amount of testing. You're gonna have to have some crap that they're gonna destruct. They're gonna spray it seven days before and try and prove that there isn't any residue in that wheat. And if they can prove that, hey, you know what, without a doubt, we're gonna spray it seven days before and it'll be completely gone before it gets harvested, then they'll get a seven day pre-harvest interval. But with most chemical companies, they say, look, realistically, no farmer's gonna spray seven days before harvesting wheat. They're gonna spray at least a month before. So they do all their testing at a month before harvest and that's where they get their date. So just because it says 28 days or 21 days, does that mean that it couldn't potentially be safer to do it even closer to harvest? Well, no, not necessarily. It just may mean that the chemical company hasn't done the testing to prove that. And if a chemical company is going to get a narrow pre-harvest interval, like let's say 24 or 48 hours, hours because there are some insecticides even that are labeled to spray on certain crops where it's 24 to 48 hours and you can harvest that crop and then eat it immediately. Okay, well why shouldn't it be that way with every crop then? Well, what it comes down to is when they have the narrow time window for a pre-harvest interval, they have to run a lot more tests because the government's going to say, okay, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense that it's only 24 hours, so we want to see ample data for this, and it might cost that chemical company several million more dollars to do that. So that's where the company says, well, are we really going to sell that much product on that particular crop, or should we just label it, like Darren said, 28 or 21 days out? Well, okay, let's just take tomatoes, for example, Brian. Yep. If you're going to eat a tomato, and you're going to go to the grocery store, and you're going to buy a tomato, and it's got all these wounds on the outside of it from a bunch that chewed on it. Are you mm -hmm. going to be excited about buying that tomato? Nope, I'm not going to buy it. It's going to sit there. Well, guess what? If I'm a tomato producer, I'm going to say, you know what? I can't have a bug come out two days before harvest. I need an insecticide that I can spray safely, and then I know a human is going to consume this tomato probably in a couple of days. So there has to be some products in those cases where you have kind of a narrow window for a pre-harvest interval. Otherwise, you just aren't going to have an edible product at the end. Now, if you've got something like wheat, 
that's a whole different story. This wheat right here is gonna get fed to livestock. Well, if you're feeding it to livestock, is a cow gonna really care if there's a little bit of a scar here and there on a couple of kernels? Probably not as big a deal. Once again, a pre-harvest interval determines the number of days that a farmer has to wait from spraying a product to actually harvesting that particular crop. And it really varies depending on what product the farmer is using and the crop that he is using it on. Well, a farmer may be out using some product to control our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? Everything is better to the power of Nutrisphere N. Nutrisphere N. Proven to shield against leaching, volatilization, and denitrification, Nutrisphere N Nitrogen Fertilizer Manager helps you maximize the efficiency of your nitrogen applications. In fact, research shows that in 184 corn trials, Nutrisphere N increases yields by an average of 13.2 bushels per acre. per acre. Do the math for yourself. Contact your local fertilizer dealer today and take your operation to the power of Nutrisphere N. For years, FarmLogic has been the easiest and most convenient way to keep up with your farming operations. Well, it just got better. Introducing FarmPad for your phone. You always have your phone with you, so entering records as they happen is as easy as a touch of a button. Chemical database, GPS, service records, and more. When you do it on the farm, save it on your phone and it's backed up forever. Call or visit farmlogic.com for a free trial and find out why FarmLogic is the best decision tool for the farm. Back in 1966, Advanced Drainage Systems, Inc. was the first company to start manufacturing plastic agricultural drainage pipe in the United States. And today, ADS continues our leadership with superior pipe production and service capabilities. Our roots are firmly entrenched in the agriculture industry, and we're committed to helping farmers grow their business. With 54 manufacturing plants and 24 distribution yards throughout the world, you can count on ADS and our green-striped pipe to be there when you need us. Advanced Drainage Systems, the green-striped pipe you can count on. Harvest season is just around the corner, and Titan Machinery is getting you ready with our Case IH Combine Clinics. Let the Titan experts get your equipment in top shape and help you get the most out of your machine. If you want the highest quality grain in your hopper without leaving anything in the field, then learn from the pros at our upcoming clinics. Go to www.titanmachinery.com to register for your clinic and to get qualified for door prizes. Or talk to your local Titan store. Titan Machinery and Case IH better solutions. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Azar, singer-songwriter. Really happy that Brad Swenson and Swenson Investments asked me to write the song American Farmer. The American Farmer. I've had the pleasure of getting to know the fine folks at Swenson, and I gotta ask you, do you know what would happen to your farm if something happened to you? Swenson's works with farmers, lawyers, and their advisors to put together the best estate plan. Hey, you work hard for your farm. They work hard to help you keep it. You know what, Brian? I gotta give it to you. Your wheat doesn't look too bad this year. Except for this little area. <laughs> what happened here? We got a little compaction? Well, lack no, of rain? no I'm, I'm pretty sure it was just completely drought right here. Well, you know, this yeah, one spot, spot and The rains are a little yes, spotty. Right. <laughs> No, the reason why we're standing right here, yes, it is a compaction issue that right here, right at the entrance of a field. But I just thought, you know, this is exactly how some of the drought-stricken wheat looks around the country, unfortunately. And that problem got even worse with the corn crop this year. Now, soybeans, at this point, we could still have some late rains and have a fantastic, even the best soybean crop the United States has ever seen. But the corn crop it's not going to be there. We've got the worst drought this year since 1988, they say, and it might even be worse than that. I don't know. We'll see how everything shakes out here yet this winter when all the crop gets in. All right, well, my question is, when you think about drought, and all right, let's just say that we get 100 bushel corn instead of the 200 bushel corn we were going for. Well, we put enough fertilizer out there for 200 bushel corn. We put all the weed control out there that, you know what, we didn't get enough moisture to activate some of that, so I'm sure some of those residual products may still be hanging on for a little bit longer, maybe even into next year's crop. What do we do with all that? Okay, so you've got all this fertilizer out there. Let's start there. And only half of it got used up. How are you going to address things going into next year? Let's go back many, many years now. And, you know, honestly, for Darren and me, we don't have a lot of experience with drought. We have lots of experience with flooding because in the last 20 years, we've had excessive rain just about every single year. But if you go back to 1976, our dad has talked about 1976 many times over the years, and he just said we had very little rain. In fact, we had less rain that summer than the Mojave Desert, he likes to tell us. Well, anyway, he just said in 1977, so the next year, 
They planted corn on corn, beans on beans. And one of the reasons why is there was all this fertilizer that was left over from the corn crop that everybody fertilized. And you know what? Hardly any of it got used up. Now it just depends on your situation on your farm. On our farm, I'm expecting an 80% crop. Okay, so, you know, really do we have a lot of carryover fertilizer left? No. But if you're getting a 20% crop or a 40% crop, or maybe unfortunately a zero, then this is definitely something you might want to consider planting corn on corn and beans on beans so you have the right fertilizer for next year. Well, applied fertilizer is certainly one thing, Brandon. We all know exactly how much we applied because we had to pay for it and it was kind of spendy this year. But let's talk about the fertilizer that we didn't apply. You know, we've been trying to build up organic matter levels on our soils and when we do that, it's not just because it's a fun thing to do, it's because it's going to help us out. It's going to help our soils and we get a free release of nutrients through mineralization of that organic matter. So as our organic matter breaks down through the heat of the summer, uh, all of a sudden we've got all these extra nutrients out there. And it's been interesting to watch uh, even some of the university trials where they're trying to uh, tune in to just the right nitrogen rate. When they apply no nitrogen and they get virtually no crop out there, they end up with more nitrates after that. And they say, well, how can that be compared to where you put a whole bunch of fertilizer on? Well, if you put plant food out and plants grow, plants consume the plant food. Well, if you don't put plant food out, you get no plant growth, but then you get this free release of nutrients from your organic matter. Now all of a sudden you have all this food out there and no crop to consume it. So you have to keep those things in mind. If you've had a complete zero out on the drought, well, guess what? Your organic matter didn't really realize that that was gonna happen. It, it can't control anything. It's just gonna start breaking down over time and you've got a bunch of plant nutrients out there that are available and you have to keep those in mind as well. So you may have, like you say, some extra fertilizer from your corn, but you also have extra fertilizer that that organic matter released. And because it's been exceptionally warm, a lot of times organic matter releases even faster than normal. And this is one of the reasons why, going back to 1976, yes, there was a horrible crop in this part of the country in 1976, but in 1977, it was the best crop many farmers had ever raised in their entire lives. The reason why, and one of the big reasons that we're talking all the time about why certain farmers get higher yields is because they had more fertility available. You have to have plant food available if you want to raise a great crop. All right, well, plant food is one thing, Brian, but we also applied crop protection products, some herbicides out there trying to control weeds. And one of the tough things about weeds is they pop up late in the summer, as we're seeing right now. So guys like to use residual products that are going to continue killing weeds even weeks after we applied the product. Now that's a good thing most years, but on a year that it's really, really dry, hey, you know what? Uh, we didn't get enough moisture to really activate some of that herbicide and get it taken in by weeds and, and whatnot. And so we've got a little bit of that pesticide left out in the field. So what do we do with those crop protection products? Well, first of all, this year isn't done. So we don't know necessarily if we're gonna have a bad carryover problem into next year or not. Well, that's true, Brian. You are the eternal optimist. You're still thinking, <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's gonna turn around any right, day now. Right. We're gonna start getting rain. <laughs> but let's just say that it doesn't. What if it does stay dry the rest of the way? And we do have some of these residual products left. You really have to pay attention to what you have. Now you can say, well, I read the label and it says I can rotate to this crop 10 yep. months later. Well, guess what? The last six months don't count because it hasn't rained and we're going to have that some of that product left. So you really have to pay attention to which product you're dealing you with. You do. And so I'll talk to farmers all the time that'll say, well, yeah, but if I have a carryover issue, the company's going to stand behind it. So what? So the company's going to stand behind it. Do you really want to see your crop suffer next year? No. Why take that kind of risk? So if you used a product that has lots of residual, then just consider planting that same crop again. So in other words, if it was a corn product, let's take Laudus, Callisto, or Impact that were used late in corn this year at the full rate in a lot of cases. And in some cases, they were even doubled up in areas of the field if you overlapped a little bit. Well, I'll be honest with you, you know, you're gonna probably have a carryover issue next year if you don't get any rain. That's just the way it is. And in fact, on a lot of the ag chemical labels, it will say if you have less than this amount of rain, now you need to add on to your rotational restriction. Well, the same thing would be true if you have certain pHs in your soil as well. If you've got a product like, say, uh, Pursuit or Raptor or Beyond, if you're using that product, especially when you get to the full rates, that one can carry over a little bit too, especially if you have a dry year like this. But the other thing would be if you have a very low soil pH. So you could have more than one factor that's going to kind of weigh in. You say, well, I'm normally pushing it just a little bit, 
I've got this low soil pH, but we've been getting enough moisture. Hey, now you've got two factors going against you and you really have to watch those things if you're rotating. And this is especially concerning the further north you are in the United States because there really aren't that many months left until freeze up in say North Dakota or Montana, for example. Now, if you're in Alabama, it's a whole different deal and you've got plenty of time to get rain before you raise a crop next spring and most likely you're not going to have a carryover issue there whereas the same product could be used at the same time way to the north in the United States and there could be a major problem going into 2013. Well when there's a drought year like this year I mean there are a lot of things that you've got to focus on more so than what we just talked about today but we were really focused on herbicide carryover type issues and, and what kind of impacts you could have next year if you had a little herbicide left over. And the other thing is fertility. You spent a lot of money on your crop fertility program. If you didn't use it all up this year, make sure that you're gonna use it up next. Yeah, and at least be soil testing this fall so you know what actually is left out there because really you could save quite a bit of money on fertilizer going into next year if you only need half as much compared to normal. Well, you may need some of that money, Brian, if you have our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to control this tough weed coming up later in the show. Micronutrients are not optional for plants, they are essential. TJ Micromix is a profit-proven management tool that ensures the availability of essential secondary and micronutrients. Formulated as a dry granule or liquid, TJ Micromix is plant available, easy to mix and apply. The synergistic fertilizer mix delivers consistent yield response on a variety of crops by complementing an NPK fertilizer program. Maximize yield on your farm this season. Call TJ Technologies or your fertilizer dealer and get your TJ Micromix today. For lower costs and higher production, for your Mandaco dealer. Ask about the best production built land roller on the market. Mandaco, simple design for easy transport and easy use. 12 to 62 foot widths, heavy duty 4x8x3 inch tube frame and now available with a steerable wing wheel. Mandaco land rollers, improve soil to seed contact, faster more uniform germination, less moisture loss. Eliminate downtime due to rocks. See your Mandaco dealer. Visit northcountrymarketing.biz or call 877-915-8790. Not a weed. Hi. It's, it's our, our Agriculture Liquid, Liquid sales, sales Professional. professional. Brian's never really liked salesmen. But I like him. I heard you talking about testing products to make sure they work. You know, Agriculture Liquid Fertilizers does more research to prove our products than any other fertilizer company. Yeah, I've seen your reports. There's a ton of proof. We've been to the North Central Research Station. We've seen AgriLiquid's 500-acre proving ground up close and personal. We know that when we use agriculture liquid fertilizers, it's like having all that research on our farm. It's like having Dr. Jerry and the team right here in your field. Dr. Who? Find out how Dr. Jerry and his team can help you increase yields at www.farmguytv.com. Hey, we have field days at the North Central Research Station in late summer. You're all invited. Case IH set the standard for improving power and fuel economy with SCR technology. While others were still trying to decide what the standard was, only efficient power from Case IH is proven in the field 10,000 times over. And you'll find it in all our high horsepower equipment, from tractors to combines to sprayers. The world of farming is changing. Will you be ready? I'm ready. To learn more about how you can be ready with a proven leader, visit caseih.com slash efficient power. 2012 isn't even done, but everybody's already talking about what's going to happen going into 2013 with input costs. So today we wanted to discuss fertilizer, ag chemical products, and seed, and what is going to happen for next year. Well, you know what, Brian, over the last few years, now not counting this year, uh, we've had some pretty good years, so there's quite a few farmers that have some money in the bank that say, you know what, I'm in a good spot here. I yeah, can do but some you know what? Yeah. Will it benefit me to buy stuff now or wait until later? But see, even this year could turn out pretty good for a lot of farmers because the crop price is going up so much. Even if you ended up with a zero on your farm, if you had good crop insurance, you could still be making a profit. Granted, it might not be the profit that you were hoping to make, but at least you're not going broke because of the crop insurance that we've got today. Well, that's certainly helpful, Brian. But again, you know, we still have to look at things in terms of return on investment. I've got some cash now, or I could borrow some cash now. Is it gonna be worth it to buy stuff now 
versus what they're going to be in the fall or what they're going to be next year. Okay, so let's just start with a real quick example with crop protection products. So Roundup recently went up and we've had a lot of farmers asking, well, should I buy my Roundup? Should I buy my Callisto and Lauda? Should I buy my Harness? All these products. And I just say, look, if you buy it in the middle of the summer, you're going to pay the full in-season price. As soon as we get to September, October, November, all these big ag chemical companies, they have 2013 terms for the retailers. So in effect, you can buy it in the fall, as a general rule, 10% less expensive than you can buy it in the summer. That's why we're always talking to farmers about prepaying, buying early. Okay, one of the big things that's happened in the last few years is in terms of Chinese manufacturing, there are far fewer manufacturing plants today than there were just a few years ago. So just a few years ago, there were as many as 2,000 big ag chemical manufacturing plants in China. Now they say there are only around 200. So we are expecting a three to 5% price increase on most ag chemical products. Now certainly Roundup has gone up a little bit more than that this summer. You've also seen a few other products go up this summer because the big companies have learned from 2008 that you know what, when we indicate to the market we're gonna go up in price, we should probably take the price up right away. Otherwise, everybody buys up for 2009 and oh, we don't sell anything in 2009. And by the way, we sold everything that did get sold was all at 2008 prices. So they all are taking price increases during the summer to try to beat that. Well, I think some of it too is that guys are trying to load up a little bit on some of these products that got tight supply. Yep. There are so many tight supply products this year that I know farmers that said, wow, I'm not letting that happen to me yeah, again. Next year, I'm going to buy some right now. You know what, though? It, honestly, anybody that prepaid in the fall and they ordered the, the actual product in the fall, they took delivery early, like let's say February, March, April, they got everything they wanted. Well, okay, so you're saying communication wasn't very good. You well, know, I'm we, saying order early and prepay, and, and then you don't have to worry about this supply shortage well, stuff. Well, maybe not everybody has as much fun pre-planning as you do, Brian. I mean, <laughs> Brian looks at it, oh, I'm gonna have this many acres this, this many yep. acres that. I wanna know every last little detail. I wanna have it all booked. I wanna have it all picked up early. I mean, that's yeah, a great but, thing, Brian, but yeah. not everybody plans that far ahead. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is with this market that we've got, you have to plan ahead as much as you can. Okay, let's talk about seed a little bit because that's something you definitely have to plan ahead for. And every year there are supply shortages of the hot numbers. There's always enough seed to go around. It's just not necessarily what you want. So well, what's going to happen with seed prices going into next year? Well, I certainly expect seed prices will be up. And How you know, then? part of it, like with soybeans, for example, look at what the soybean market's doing. And when that soybean market moves from $10 up to $14, for example, well, I expect I'm going to get at least a $4 per unit increase on my soybean seed. When we look at corn, now that we've got refuge in the bag, really those seed companies need to know what do you want on your farm? If you want refuge in a bag, tell your seed dealer what you want. Order those things early because okay, they they're they going to package yes, them but up. as far as price goes, because that's the focus here, I would say on average you're looking at a 3 to $5 a bag increase on corn prices, but certainly the brand new traits, they're going to be a little higher. Okay, well those things are nice brands, seed and chemical, but the biggest expense for most farmers in terms of crop inputs is fertilizer. Yep. So what's that going to do? Well, Personally, I don't think it's going to go up much because demand's going to be way down. If you look at drought, that means that there was fertilizer left from this year going into next year. So I see fertilizer rates getting dramatically cut on a lot of farms around the country. Overall demand is going to be way down. So price should come down. Now we'll really see if the true market factors are going to carry in fertilizer or if they're just going to continue to follow crop prices. Well, there's certainly a lot of things going on in terms of crop inputs. We look for slightly increased crop input prices for next year, but it's going to vary depending on what you're using. Well, what you're using may have to change a little bit if you've got our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to control it coming up next. The Weed of the Week is sponsored by Ag PhD Summer Field Day 2012, July 27th at the Hefty Farm in Baltic, South Dakota. For more information, go to agphd.com. Our Weed of the Week is crabgrass. It's a warm season annual grass. How are we going to control it? That's one of the things we had trouble with in lawns this year is that some of the perennials that were cool season grasses really went into dormancy early and the warm season grasses like crabgrass just had a great year. You know, when you see crabgrass out in your lawn, you think, man, I got to get rid of that stuff. But the best time to do it is actually before that crabgrass is up. We like to spray real early in the spring. This year, it was about three or four weeks earlier than we normally do. But typically when the lilacs are blooming, 
blooming, that's about the right time to apply your crabgrass prevention. So the product we'll use on our farm is Drive, but Dimension and other products are also out there that are very good as well. The main thing is just to make sure you're spraying and spraying timely. If you're spraying too early, if you're spraying, let's say a month earlier than the crabgrass is gonna show up, a lot of times you don't have enough residual left when the crabgrass actually does show up. Also products like Drive have some activity in terms of burn down. So if a little bit of the crabgrass is started and you hit it at that early stage, you can get burned down there, plus leave yourself residual for later season control. That's all time we have for our Weed of the Week crabgrass, but there's more Ag PhD to come after this. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. The world of farming is changing. From the power and versatility of Steiger and Magnum tractors to the legendary reliability of axial flow combines, Case IH can help you be ready. To learn more, visit caseih.com forward slash be ready. As wheat acres are harvested this summer, one of the things many wheat farmers are doing is planting cover crops. We'll talk about that in today's Iron Talk. When you think about cover crops for your wheat acres, what are you planting? chances are it's going to be a mix of three or four different cover crops. There are very few farmers that seed all of one thing, like say radishes for example. You could certainly seed a whole field to radishes, but most guys want to do a few different crops out there to get a little bit of a mix for some different purposes, whether it's protecting from soil erosion, improving nutrient availability for next year, increasing organic matter, or any number of purposes that you could be planting a cover crop. The challenge with any of these blends though is the seed size is greatly different. Now, if you have an air cart with several different compartments, perhaps you can do a pretty good job. We aren't blessed with that. We've got just your standard drill and when you're gonna have something like that for your equipment for seeding, you may just make an extra pass. Run once with the broadleaf seed and another time with the grass or, or something along those lines. So when it comes to cover crops, they aren't the easiest thing to seed, but the benefits far outweigh the challenges getting them in the ground. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. Speed, strength, and efficiency make Capello corn heads a head above the rest. Built with polymer components that exceed industry standards, Capello corn heads continue to push the boundaries for maximizing grain retention while using less energy. Visit CapelloUSA.com and learn more about Capello's state-of-the-art chopping technology that cuts cleaner, allowing your horsepower to remain where it belongs, with your combine, so you can harvest faster in all weather conditions. Add to that an amazing folding feature and it's clear to see why Capello is a head above the rest. Why do more farmers choose Genuity VT Double Pro Rib Complete Corn Blend? For maximum yield protection. With two powerful ways to control above ground insects like corn earworm, corn borer, and fall armyworm. Plus convenient refuge in a bag with 95% traded seed and 5% refuge seed. That's simplicity. That's Genuity VT Double Pro Rib Complete Corn, the number one choice of farmers. Over the generations, fertilizer, the unsung hero of the farm, has been in the background, quietly nourishing crops with very little fanfare. Until now. Meet the next generation of fertilizer. Micro Essentials. Back in 1966, Advanced Drainage Systems, Inc. was the first company to start manufacturing plastic agricultural drainage pipe in the United States. And today, ADS continues our leadership with superior pipe production and service capabilities. Our roots are firmly entrenched in the agriculture industry, and we're committed to helping farmers grow their business. With 54 manufacturing plants and 24 distribution yards throughout the world, you can count on ADS and our green-striped pipe to be there when you need us. Advanced Drainage Systems, the green-striped pipe you can count on. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. Introducing the all new Backsaver Swing Hopper Auger Mover. Backsavers have interchangeable parts which allows you easy access to move or swing your augers to fit your harvesting needs. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. That's all the time we have for today's show, but be sure to join us again next time for another Weed of the Week Iron Talk Farm Basics and a whole lot more. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. Only 11.6 cents per dollar spent on food in America goes back to American farmers and agribusinesses. Where does the other 88.4% go? And what really raises food prices? Visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org to find out.